We're going to have one more lesson on the New Covenant. Uh, this is really kind of tie up any loose ends that might still exist out there. Um, I want to make clear that by and large we're unified and understand the New Covenant is something that God makes with Israel. He makes it at the end or in a sequence with all the other remaining covenants. And those covenant promises will be fulfilled to Israel. There's no disagreement about that. What we're looking for here is really kind of a fine point. Uh, and it's something that even people, dispensationalists, that we would agree with fully still wrestle with as the best way to understand the church's relationship to the New Covenant. I mentioned that uh, as I was going on vacation this book, and these are three guys, and it says on the back of the book, the three, book, the three views in this book are unified by a single idea, God will fulfill His New Covenant with Israel. And that's in uh, distinction for the, to those who embrace covenantal theology that says that the church is the new Israel. And we don't believe that. We don't believe that the Bible teaches that. So, but these three guys have three different views of what the church's relationship is to the New Covenant. And I've, I've only read parts of this so far. It's a very good book. So I want to say if you... If you want to go further than what we will go as we end up today, I would strongly encourage you to read this book. I can also pass along some other articles to you. But it's just helpful to see how people come at it from different angles, different perspectives. But again, largely trying to understand what the church's relationship to the New Covenant is. And that's what we're going to talk about in this last lesson. I'm going to do that through a series of questions to you. We'll, we'll just go from there. The key factors in our discussion, again, I've said this already, but there's significant agreement between the various dispensational positions with regard to the fulfillment of the promises of the covenant. We looked at Jeremiah 31 you know, several weeks ago now. Those promises are made to Israel and Judah. They'll be fulfilled to Israel and Judah. The church is not the new Israel. And the promises can't be spiritualized and somehow seen as being fulfilled in the church today. Covenants made with Israel, so its promises will be fulfilled to Israel in the future. Uh, the book of Revelation in particular spells out particularly the time period, that millennial kingdom in yeah. Revelation 20 is when all those promises that were not fulfilled at Christ's first coming will be fulfilled. And there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them in the latter prophets. So, as I've already said as well, this is a nuanced and ongoing discussion. I, I remember when I was in seminary, this was back from 96 to 2001, and this was an issue that we were talking about as seminary students. And I think our own professors would just have some disagreement about the language and the way that you understand and articulate this relationship between Israel and the covenant, or between the church and the covenant. Hopefully our discussion this morning will, will be helpful to you. But again, I would this is a, such a complex and nuanced discussion that I would encourage you, if you want to follow up on something or just go into it in more detail, get a copy of this book. It's called Dispensational Understanding of the New Covenant. It's three different contributors. And there's a lot of these three and four of you books out there that have different understandings of some biblical concept very helpful to read these kind of books to me because you get to see the people present their own case and their own arguments and you get to see the people that have the other views respond and it's just a very helpful way of seeing what the differences are let's look at this passage because it is the key passage on the new covenant it's certainly not the only place even in the old testament that talks about the new covenant but it is the one place in the old testament that explicitly references the New Covenant. Let's look at it again just as the basis of our discussion this morning. The whole days are coming, declares the Lord, when I make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. That covenant being, of course, what? The Mosaic Covenant. That was the covenant that God made with Israel as they came out of Egypt and came down to Sinai. We made the case that Deuteronomy was a renewal of that same covenant 
with a new generation because the first generation had died out in the wilderness. My covenant, the Mosaic covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. That's just uh, a symbolism for the close relationship that God has with his people Israel. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days. And I think if you go back and read Jeremiah 31 previous to this verse, it makes clear that after those days is still future to us. I make that point because well, people would say that the new covenant is ratified at the cross. And again, it comes down to what do you mean by ratified? It comes down to that kind of question. Certainly the sacrifice of Christ was necessary for the forgiveness of Israel's sins. It was necessary as the basis for which the new covenant can be put into operation. I would argue that the new covenant has not yet been made with Israel, that it is still future. They're entering into that covenant is still future. And that's what this is talking about. This is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them. That hasn't been done yet. And on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach again, each man his neighbor, each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. Well, that I think Donna brought this up several Sundays ago. Clearly, that's exactly what we're doing in the church today. We're telling people to know the Lord. So that can't be being fulfilled today. This is talking about a point at which the whole nation of Israel will know their God in a way they never have in their history. There's always been a remnant, but there's never been a wholesale, wholesale within the nation, everybody regenerated, everybody knowing the Lord, everybody walking in obedience to the law. That's what this is described. Right. Yes. When it says, that they shall all know me, right. is that referring to Israel only? I think so. Oh, okay. Now, certainly there's going to be a worldwide knowledge of the Lord as well because Israel all knows Him. Well, a lot of unbelievers. That's right. Over the course of the millennium, there is a lot of unbelievers. Uh, at the very beginning, it's only believers right. because of the judgments. But I think in this context, it is talking about just Israel and Judah. Okay. Uh, when you say believers, you mean like just Israel and Judah? As prophesied here in Jeremiah 31, yes. Okay. So... This is where in the millennium that Christ is actually raised on earth. That's right. And they're still unbelievers. Okay, again, as you, be, as you think about it this way, as you get through the tribulation period, Christ comes back at the end of that tribulation period, he executes judgments, and only believers enter the millennial kingdom. Now, there are us, there are we as the church and glorified bodies that are in that millennial kingdom. There are people that survive the tribulation period that enter the kingdom in unglorified bodies. And initially, they're all believers. Over the course of that thousand years, those people that are in bodies that are not yet glorified reproduce. In fact, they create the nations all over again. And even though Christ is on the earth, he's ruling, there's full knowledge of the Lord all over the world, there are still people over the course of that thousand years that are not believers. How do we know that? <clears throat> the same causes of rebellion. Exactly. At the very end of the thousand years, there's a rebellion that shows that these people were not believers. Now, it's different than it is now because you've got Christ on the earth. You've got him executing justice quickly. You've got Israel uh, fulfilling the role that he designed them to be. But there's even references in the Old Testament that talk about the nations who don't bring the appropriate sacrifices to Israel. God won't send uh, rain on their, on their lands. You've got, uh, you still have death. So you still have the curse there. It's not like the eternal state. The thousand year period is different from the eternal state in which certainly there is only believers at, at that point. All unbelievers are in the lake of fire. So it's a good question. It starts with only believers. It ends up with both believers and unbelievers. Those unbelievers rebel one final time against Christ. So can I ask a question? Sure. I get confused because of all the different views on the end. You're saying that the church is raptured. They're not there for seven years, but then they come back for the thousand years? That's right. Okay. And it's like just the people that were through the tribulation. Yeah, it's, to me it's helpful to think about it this way. 
at the beginning of the tribulation period, like you said, the church is taken out of the world. You start out during that period with only unbelievers. That's all that's left on the earth. But over the course of that seven years, the gospel continues to be proclaimed, and there are people that become believers. Israel herself is regenerated as a nation during that tribulation period. Revelation talks about the fact that halfway through that period, she's taken away to a place in the wilderness where she's provided for by God and protected. So, beginning of the tribulation, all unbelievers at the end, there's both believers and unbelievers. The unbelievers are separated out so that you enter the millennial kingdom with only believers. The very first part of the thousand years, only believers. Because God has separated the but sheep from the goat. That's right. That's the part that I was Yeah, I understand. I understand. Yeah, they're different, right? The they things. are different. And the reason we say they come back, if you look at the end of Revelation 19, it talks about the armies of God that come back with Christ. And it talks about those people sitting on thrones and judging with Christ. And I, I believe those are the church. Not, some people, I guess, would take them as angels. They come back in white garments. But I think, you know, we're, we're promised to rule and reign with Christ on the earth. And we do that during that thousand year period of the millennium. The fact that there's a rebellion at the end proves that environment is not the solution to man's problem. That's exactly right. Just as with the Garden of Eden, man was in a perfect environment, he chose to sin. He'll be in a, a perfect environment. Well, the curse is still there during the millennial kingdom, but he'll be in a society that is just and with a completely righteous ruler who executes justice all over the world, and yet he will still rebel. So it's a very strong uh, emphasis on the depravity of man. And it only gets fully taken away as we enter into the new heavens and new earth. So the other question I have is, um, this, if you're saying this is the main passage that talks about it, was that something that Israel knew really well and had access to? Like, I feel like the Torah, they all knew. But I would think that if this is later, that it either wasn't in book form readily available to them, or, like, how well did they know it was going on? Okay, so which generation are you speaking of? Is I'm that thinking about people in Jesus' time, maybe, okay. like, or even before that, like, how, how did they know it? How much did they know it? You think about the... Uh, no, you're the Old the, Testament the, guy. Mike, you know, when, when, Herod, when Herod queried the Jewish leaders and they were like, well, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Because that was from this sort of time period as well as the last part. Okay, that's what I wanted, yeah. wanted yeah. to so they were aware. It, I knew there were different times and different, maybe um, some were more obscure than others. That's what I was trying to figure out. Was well, it's a fair... Yes. It's a fair and interesting question to me because... People just didn't have access. They didn't have their own copies of the scripture the way we do today. They relied upon the priest and the synagogues as they went into exile to teach them these things. And one way you might compare it to people today, how well do people know the Old Testament today? You know, even Christians. We have Bibles that are readily available to us in our own language. Uh, I don't, you could query, I think, a lot of Christians today, and they would be able to tell you about what this is describing in the Old Testament. And then, I mean, I don't know what said, <laughs> but um, then you had people like Nicodemus when Jesus was like, well, how am I going to talk to you about heavenly things when you don't even know these things? That's right. Have you not, you don't need to always say, have you not read? Exactly. You know, because they, they didn't understand. Exactly. You know, so there's a difference between knowing what it says and understanding what it says. This was a guy who was a leader of Israel, and he didn't fully understand the new birth. So... I guess my other question is like, was this part of like, was this scripture to them? Was it canonized or whatever you want to call it at that at like Jesus' time for them? I think it would they have been canonized by then. Yes. Okay. So I think the issue there would have been not that it wasn't canonized, but was it how available it was it to them? That would depend on how faithful they were to go uh, be part of the synagogues to listen to the teaching. It seems to me that there, just by virtue of the fact that that it wouldn't have necessarily all been under one cover as we have in our Bibles today and they would have personal copies of them. It would be less available in that sense, but still available. I think, in my case, I, there's a presupposition that God makes his revelation available to those who seek it. And I think it would have been available to them if they, if they wanted to know. 
in contrast to somebody like Nicodemus, you have somebody like, or two people, Zacharias and Mary, who showed great familiarity with the Old Testament. And I think it was, I think it was related to their character and the fact that they wanted to know. They understood the covenants. If you look at Mary and Zacharias' response to the angels appearing to them about the coming birth of John the Baptist in Christ, uh, they have, they're theologians. I mean, they really understand how the covenants work and they're looking for the fulfillment of the new covenant or the coming of the Messiah. So these are the things that God is promising in the new covenant. They shall not teach again each man his neighbor, and each man his brother, saying, No, Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. Again, I think in the context it's talking about Israel and Judah, but not, not excluding the fact that their repentance and their embracing of Christ as Lord is going to have impact for all the nations all over the world. I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. Now again, I made the case earlier, I, just, I don't think Israel has entered into this covenant yet. I would argue that they're still under the curses of the Mosaic Covenant. Now it's true that the Mosaic Covenant itself has passed off the scene in the sense that the temple has been destroyed and the people aren't able to keep the law uh, by, by virtue of that fact. What, what are the people of Israel and anybody, for that matter, responsible to do today. And repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only way of salvation. Jew and Gentile alike. That's what makes the church different from Israel. And this period that we're living in different, both from what has come before and what will be in the future. All right. So now, and we've kind of covered some of these already, but I just want to ask these questions to you uh, and in the process kind of clarify where, where I am on this part. And I'm, I'm open to being having my mind changed on this some. I've really enjoyed reading this book and I, I still got more to read of it. Uh, but this is an issue in my own walk with the Lord that I've been grappling with since seminary days. And, and again, the main points are clear. I would not argue that the new covenant has been fulfilled in the church in any way, based on what we just read, Jeremiah 31. And I'm going to argue something different, but I'll, I'll wait till we get there. With whom is the new covenant made? That's an obvious question. Who is it, Isaiah? Israel and Judah. House of Israel, house of Judah. They'll be reunited the way that they were before. You know, they split because of Solomon's sin, and under the new covenant, they come back together. So here's a, an important question. Has this covenant already been made? Has it already been cut with the house of Israel and the house of Judah? What would you say? Okay. What, what would be the basis of saying it's already been started? Because the, um, the sacrifice has been given for it. Okay. Okay, so you can say the sacrifice has been made for it and it's open to any Jews. And let's think about this. The book of Acts shows that the church itself was very much predominantly Jewish as it began. So you can make the case, we would all agree that the sacrifice has been made for it. Uh, to me, I would argue that that's different from them entering into the covenant. Uh, and so I have to explain in light of that, what does Christ mean when he says, this is the blood of the new covenant? Well, it is the blood of the new covenant, but it is also more than that. It is the blood that has paid the price for sin for all the nations. Not just for sins from the cross forward, the sins of all mankind of all time were paid for by the death of Christ. So I would argue even the sins of people that preceded Moses, that preceded the Old Covenant, were paid for by the blood of Christ. Did those people who were believers come under the New Covenant? I would say no. And I would say that the New Covenant is still to be instituted. It's still to be instituted with Israel. Now Christ's blood is the blood of that covenant, 
No question about that. But the covenant itself, I just don't think that's the best way to think about it, that it's already started, that it's already started to be fulfilled. I would see the church and Israel separate even in that sense. Okay, the second question that I have to answer in that regard is what, well, I think it's, it's coming. I won't answer that. Is that like Amil thinking that it's, that's uh, happening, yep. rattling currently? Yes. Okay. So the Amils would say, and you can say what Adia said and not be an Amil, to be sure. Because okay. these guys, some of these guys argued that the covenant was ratified at the cross. But you can also say it was ratified at the cross and the, the, the people of God now are the church and therefore the new covenant is already in effect. So what about the people that are currently, uh, that, are, that are Jews or are coming to Christ like right now? How right. does that come into it? So let me ask you that question. What about the people that are becoming believers right now? How is it that they're reconciled with God? Is it through the new covenant? Yes. I would say no. Well, no, I mean, it's through the blood of Christ. It's there. through the blood of Christ. Right. And that's what I would argue that the book of Hebrews is talking about. Not that the new covenant has already started, but that the mediator of the new covenant has already been made known. That is the means by which we have what we have as Christians today. That's why, that's why I, when I said the new covenant, I was, for some reason, I was mixing it up with when you said Christ said that just the blood of the new covenant. Talking about the one that Christ made rather than the one that's the one of Jeremiah. Right? That well, no, now, let's be careful. I don't think there's two new covenants. Some people make that argument. The dispensationalists in the past have especially said, well, there's a new covenant for Israel and a new covenant for the church. I don't think so. There's only one new covenant. Okay. But... The mediator of the new covenant is the same for both entities. So, which, which covenant is, it is Christ talking about when he says the new covenant? I think he's talking about the one Jeremiah 31. Okay. So, is that, is that, the, um, is that the covenant for, like, within the last days of 144,000? So, I would, I would say, even though the 144,000. Like, within the last days, like, in Zephaniah. Then he'll give them, you know, their original language and, you know, just things that are going to be happening within them. Yes. You know, the walls are going to be within their heart. Right. Like that. So the 144,000, I think, precede the actual regeneration of the nation. And I would say that God enters into the new covenant with Israel when the whole nation that's left, well, I say the whole nation, you know, many Israelites will be put to death during the tribulation period because they have not lived. But there'll come a point during that tribulation where God regenerates Israel and takes them away to the wilderness. So to me, that's the point. And the only reason I, I don't say it is the 144,000 because I think they come a little bit earlier and they are, they are proclaimers of the gospel through that period of time. They end up being martyred, but they end up also overcoming. So I would put the regeneration of the nation a little bit earlier than their ministry. <clears throat> All right, so this question is, does the New Testament in general, and the book of Hebrews in particular, argue that the new covenant has already been fulfilled? I would say no. Already begun to be fulfilled. Right? Okay, thank you. That's an important correction. Already begun to be fulfilled because that's really the question. And I would say no. Now again, I think the hardest thing for me to defend is what then is the message of the book of Hebrews. And what does Paul mean in 2 Corinthians 3 when he says he's a minister in the new covenant? And again, this is, these are the questions that these guys are dealing with in this book. It seems to me that the message of the book of Hebrews, as it's written to Hebrew Christians who have become members of the church in the sense that they've embraced Christ as the Messiah, they have started to get persecution from their fellow countrymen who have not embraced the Messiah, and they're thinking about going back to the Mosaic system. And the main argument of the book of Hebrews is you cannot do that. Because to do that is to walk away from Christ. So you're going to forsake Christ as the mediator of the new covenant in order to go back to this old system. 
And so the warnings are against that. And you mean going back to the mosaic as adding for salvation? Yes. Yeah. For salvation and, you know, for the priesthood, for the temple sacrifices, which was all that was still operating as Hebrews was being written. But yes, in the sense of saying, well, we believe this is something that God has given us. We're going to stick with it, and we're not going to go with Christ. Um, I, I want to be quick to add that. I believe there was a transitional period there where you could embrace Christ and still offer sacrifices. I say that because Paul did it. But what these people were doing were saying, okay, we were with Christ. We were part of the church. And we're not sure we like this deal. It's causing us to be cut off from our families. Uh, we hear these people that are saying, from our people, from the nation of Israel, he's not the Messiah. We're going to go back to the way it was before. And that's what he's saying you can't do. Now, still, it speaks about the new covenant being enacted on better promises, it says in Hebrews 8. I, to me, that's a key word there. And I looked that word up. Uh, just to see what it was in the Greek. And the first definition is it's a covenant ordained by law. And to me, one of the ways that you can understand that is this is a covenant anticipated in the Old Testament. It is one that, and that's what the point of Hebrews is there, that even the Old Testament, Old Testament anticipated a point at which the Mosaic covenant was not going to be operative anymore. And this new covenant was going to kick in. And I would say that the, the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying the mediator of that covenant has already come. He shed his blood. He is the means by which we have reconciliation with God. You can't forsake him. You have to hold on to him. It's a little different for us today as Gentiles because we were never under the old covenant. And this was not an issue for us, right? I think it's fair to say that when we came to Christ, we weren't wrestling with whether or not we had to stay under the Mosaic system. The church has been already been in existence all these years. So for us, it was just a matter of receiving Christ as our Savior and Lord. But for these guys, it was a little bit different question. All right. How are we going to understand Christ's words to the twelve when he inaugurated the Lord's Supper? This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. I'm not arguing against that. Certainly, Christ's sacrifice is the blood of the new covenant in the way that animal sacrifices were the blood of the old covenant. And, and Hebrews talks a lot about that too, and about the superiority of Christ's sacrifice. So when he spoke of the new covenant, did they think that he was initiating some kind of new covenant um, that they hadn't heard of? Or did they know what he was referencing to? as far as the new covenant in Jeremiah. Did they know that? I think they did. That's yeah. kind of what I was asking. Yeah, I understand. Prevalent was, I was trying yeah. to figure out whether they would have the context of Well, I would argue that they did. One, because they were Jews. Certainly the writer of Hebrews himself knew it because he cites it. He cites Jeremiah 31, and I think he he's assuming that they're familiar with it because that's the basis of his argument. Well, even the disciples, when they were at the, the table, they know exactly, okay, this is the blood of the new covenant. They were like, well, okay, he's obviously speaking about I think so. Jeremiah. I think that's a fair assumption. Or is there a, I mean, I'm sure there's even a belief that um, Christians nowadays believe that Jesus was setting up some kind of new covenant then. Is that is that some kind of belief system now? Or does even theologians across the board think or know that he's talking about Jeremiah? So the idea, and does again, it does make sense. And that is an idea that's raised in this book, and that was an idea that was more popular in the past than it is today, chiefly among dispensationalists, that there are two new covenants and that Christ was talking about something different than what's described in Jeremiah 31. I, don't, I think very few people hold to that anymore, right. just as people have looked at it more closely. Some people have used that same explanation for 2 Corinthians 3. Paul is talking about uh, a new covenant in a different way than Jeremiah 31. Um, like Jeremiah is like kind of the end all at the end at the end of time, and Christ has this like current 
covenant that he's, you know what I'm saying? And then, then comes the new from Jeremiah. That well, that's not, that's not I just, what they're trying to say here. Right? You don't really, to me, as you look at the epistles as a whole that are explaining to us who Christ is, what he's done, what salvation is, you don't see them by and large pointing to even the terminology of the covenant or to the fact that we're fulfilling Jeremiah 31. They don't make that argument. That one book does, Hebrews, and it's especially directed to Jewish Christians. Um, and you can see why, because they came up through the old system. So to me, that's why I, I wouldn't say, I, I would just argue that what we have now is through Christ. In Christ is the phrase that Paul uses all the time for all that we have. And I think you can say that and still recognize that as we partake of the Lord's table together, that that is the blood of the new covenant. And we are the beneficiaries of that blood. We're the beneficiaries of Christ's death on our behalf for the forgiveness of sins. You could say that without saying that the new covenant has begun to be fulfilled. Now, again, you, there are people that say that and make the case for it. I'm not in any way condemning that. It's not the way that I would say it. It's not the way that I would articulate it. Okay. So you don't think it's begun to be fulfilled at all? No. Now, it, unless you want to, if you, if you include the necessary death of Christ in order for the new covenant to be made. Obviously, that's taking place already. But that's not even mentioned in Jeremiah 31. Yeah, I just see the, the verbiage there. It's like, this is the covenant which is poured out for you is the, the new covenant like, in my blood. So he's speaking of a, a future time. He's not speaking about right then and there. Like, this is, like, when I die, my blood's poured out, but it's going to be for a future promise. Although the blood, of course, saves, and there's kind of it's different, but yet he's just talking about future tense, right? But well, he is talking future tense. The big question becomes how far in the future before it begins, because the church doesn't start until you know at least forty days after that at Pentecost. So, to me, that's another thing you have to keep in mind. Though he's dealing with. These 12 men who are part of the nation of Israel on the one hand, but are also going to become part of the foundation of the church. Uh, but he, he has not revealed anything about the church to them. They literally just found out he's going to die. That's right. He has said to Peter, I will build my church, but they don't have any understanding of that being Jew and Gentile on absolutely equal footing in one body. That's, on, that's only going to come through later revelation. So, I keep going back to the second question. Did you listen to what he did last week? Huh? I haven't. Could it be I possible said, uh, that it's sort of like that where he's talking about the, you could probably explain it better than I did. Well, but I didn't do it well as you can. Yeah. <laughs> where it's like they become betrothed, but they're not together. There's a time where they're apart, but things are kind of being prepared, and then it's actually consummated. Yes. It could be similar to that. That's what this, I, I'm well, that is. I mean, that's a, another way to look at it. And so the question then becomes, at what point, I guess according to that argument, they've become betrothed at the cross. Is that fair? So. Like everything's there for them to be married because of what he did on the cross, except it's not consummated till later. They're not truly married till later. I mean, so I, I don't have any problem with saying it that way, that what Christ accomplished on the cross um, was necessary as the basis of the new covenant, but they don't enter into the new covenant until later. Well, also, because at this, at this point, um, after the dispersion and everything, it was a, it's a time of um, discipline, right? Just a time of, you know, punishment. That's right. They're under the curses. Under the curses. Yeah. 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 And so he talks about to the fullness of the Gentiles. So. That's what, and that's definitely the age that we're in now. There was a point at which God said, "Okay, enough, Israel, you're hardened. You're temporarily set aside until the fullness of Gentiles comes in." And you know, Matt was—he's looking at it from the vantage point of Hosea, and and certainly. 
what Hosea is saying is that there is going to reach that point where they're going to be without God for any period of time, and we are completely agreed on that, that they, uh, we're in that period now, and that there's only a later period to which they fulfill these promises. So the question then becomes, is, and this is, I guess this is that second question, is the new covenant made with Israel at the point of Christ's crucifixion? I believe you can make that case. And, and again, one of these authors does. I'm not there yet. I, I'm not there saying that the new covenant is entered into with Israel, made with Israel, at that point. I, I still see it as future. So I have a little bit different explanations of, of Hebrews because of that. Just one, just one last time. I just want to make sure that sure. I understand this. So when Christ is sitting with them, everybody at the table, and he said, um, he specifically said, the new covenant, is that, that's in reference to everybody at the table, do you think they're in agreement with when he says the new covenant, they're like, oh, he's talking about that? Yeah. Or is the new covenant like something new that he's saying this is going to be yeah. You know, a new covenant. Yeah. A new so covenant. first we have to acknowledge it's hard to know what's in their minds without them saying it. But second, it seems reasonable to me that he, he references, I think it's clear in Christ's mind that the new covenant there is the Jeremiah 31. Because it does say the new covenant, that's not right. a new covenant. Exactly. That's right. And that's, that's the very argument for pointing back to Jeremiah 31. You would think if he would say a new covenant too, he would go on to explain how it was different from the other new covenant. That's right. The other covenants. It, that's a good Because always they kind of, whenever they've had a new one, it seems like he always explains kind of differences. Exactly. And since he didn't give any differences, you would think maybe that it's the one that was already there. Exactly. Yeah, so since it says the new covenant, not a new covenant, that's right. describing the context of the new covenant. Right. Yeah, okay. I think it's a fair assumption that they knew about that new covenant and the I, I believe there's no question that that's the covenant. I mean, surely that would be a future expectation. And then, to, right. how would they even, you know, you think in their minds, like, well, we have a temple. Why would there be a, would they think that would be like a new, like a future, a better temple? Or what if they, in their minds, how, and like, you know what I mean? Because they, they have do, a temple there. Okay, they do have a temple there. Right. But what has what Christ taught them about that temple? That's right. Right, but I mean, Jews in the day, they had that temple, and then when they read Jeremiah, did they look at that like, this is confusing because we have a temple? You know what I mean? They had to think that, wow, is this going to be destroyed and then a new one, a better one is coming? So okay, so Jeremiah is not, doesn't talk about the temple so much as Ezekiel does. Is that that's what you what I mean? I keep saying Jeremiah. Okay, okay. No, okay. My I just want to make sure I understood what you're I saying. I really didn't say Jeremiah. <laughs> I keep on confusing it. I meant to say. So, you know, no, that's okay. I, I think, for one, when they came back after the exile and rebuilt the temple, I think it was clear that that didn't match up with the design of Ezekiel's temple. Whether or not they are expecting the Jew, the common Jew in the street, was expecting a new temple, it's hard to know, hard to say. I think from where we stand, as you look at it, and you know, from where we stand after the destruction of the temple, and you look at what Ezekiel says, not only about the temple, but all the attendant circumstances, it's clear that that has never happened in Israel's history. And so that's why we, we think there is another one coming in the future. All right. It seems like they expected the new covenant to be consummated immediately. And I would, I would think that they would have assumed notwithstanding the differences between what they saw and what Ezekiel wrote, that the new covenant was coming immediately, that Christ was going to return and going to set up his kingdom right there, would have been when, my guess for what they thought was going to happen. When you say they, who are you talking about? The, the, the disciples. I think they had an expectation that oh, absolutely. All, was, all was going to be about to be consummated. His death was going to bring the new covenant, the new covenant was going to come, the temple was going to be there, Christ was going to rule. Like, I don't think they would have thought that it was going to be destroyed and that was you know, anything like that. I think in their mind, they expected... But, so, but you have to square, or you have to fit in there what they've just been taught that week about the destruction of the temple, right? Yeah, so the discourse. That's right. 
That's right. So, right. but I mean, I agree that that expectation was there, particularly before you know, as he comes and proclaims the name of the kingdom and he is the Messiah. I think the expectation is still there afterward to a degree that it's the transition where they're figuring that's that right, out. Yeah. That's right. That's right. I think there's a lot of things that he taught them that they completely just it didn't fit their paradigm and they just absolutely, kind of absolutely, his death, the temple's destruction. I mean, they just he didn't even fit their image of a Messiah. Yeah, right. 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 Like they thought, the very fact that he was yeah. crucified didn't fit their image of a Messiah. And then I think later, like you said, people realize these things were it's going to be a little different than they were expecting. And as is the case with, I think, all prophecy, particularly Old Testament prophecy, the passage of time and events help you see things better than if you're in the day when the prophecy is made. So for us, it's easier to look back and say, okay, we've seen the destruction of the temple and we have it recorded for us in, uh, in history. And we recognize as we read Ezekiel that that temple didn't exist then, nor the circumstances around it so we also have the book of revelation which they didn't have at that point and the thousand years in our future it fits with with christ coming back and ruling on the davidic throne and all those things being fulfilled at that time i think you know when you read the book of revelation he assumes that you're familiar with the old testament he makes all these allusions back to the old testament and for him he's just describing hey you know, he doesn't say that every prophecy is fulfilled during the millennial kingdom. He's saying that Christ is on the earth. He rules for a thousand years. Satan is bound. I think the fact that Christ is there assumes all those other prophecies that talk about the millennial kingdom in the Old Testament. Really, all that Revelation 20 does is tell us how long it lasts. But the kingdom itself is described for us in the Old Testament. So I... I think Matt's teaching is a perspective from Hosea, and I'm not disagreeing with that perspective. Uh, I, maybe we disagree on where the ratification or where the, the covenant ceremony is, I think. And that, and that, again, is a big issue in this book. And one of the guys would argue that, the, that it does take place at the cross. But for me, I would see... The cross is the necessary sacrifice and basis of the new covenant, but that the new covenant has not been entered into yet with Israel. I think that comes later. And I, I think we're not a party to the new covenant. We're not a party to any of the covenants. What we have as Christians in the church and the spiritual privileges that we enjoy is by virtue of Christ uh, and our faith in him. Okay. So, as we celebrate the Lord's table together, you know we still we we can still call it the blood of the new covenant. We can still recognize that that blood is what paid the price of our sins. And I would argue that it is the blood of the new covenant, but it's more than that too. It's also the payment of the sins of the world, uh, both before and after. The So that kind of brings us to the last question. What is the church's relationship, if any, to the new covenant? The way that these three guys describe is there's three views. The church has no legal relationship to or participation in the new covenant. The church has an indirect relationship to the new covenant. Or the church has a direct relationship to the new covenant. And, you know, as you read these guys, I've not read all of them yet. I've not finished the book. Sometimes it just seems like they're looking at it from different perspectives. When the guy talks about having no legal relationship, he's just saying that we're not a party to the covenant, and I think everybody agrees with that. And they all agree, again, that the promises will be fulfilled to Israel. We're not fulfilling the promises. So the real questions come down to, has, it, has Israel entered into this covenant already? Did that happen at the cross, or did the cross provide the basis for that to happen, the sacrifice necessary for it to happen, and they enter into the new covenant. But that's where I am right now. Um, but it, I fully respect those who take the position that it was that it was entered into at the cross, and that we're, you know, that there's an indirect relationship somehow. I think we would all agree that we get 
some of the blessings that are promised to Israel, uh, we get them in the church now. And, and I'm talking about forgiveness of sins, reconciliation with God. The indwelling of the Spirit. That's not mentioned necessarily here in Jeremiah 31, but in other Old Testament texts that speak of that time. So I don't have any problem with saying that. But I think we have those blessings not uh, because we're, we've begun to fulfill the new covenant or the new covenant's already in force. We have them because we're part of the church and we, we have them through Christ. Couldn't you say that Christ inaugurated the new covenant and believers enter into the blessings of it but it won't be fulfilled ultimately until Israel is saved. You can't say that and that's one of these views. Um, that's not the way I would say it. Well, what would you say specifically as far as when, when Christ said this it is the new covenant of life and when Paul said I'm a minister of the new covenant yeah. what, under what conditions were they thinking that? So, I think that Christ's blood is the blood of the new covenant because it's the basis upon which uh, the promises of Jeremiah 31 can be fulfilled. That sacrifice had to be made. So, I, I'm not disagreeing that that has already been done, of course. Um, but I think you can say that without saying that the new covenant has already been entered into. <clears throat> Even to say it's been inaugurated? So for me, those are the same things. To say it's been inaugurated implies to me, uh, and maybe you mean something different, that has been entered into between God and Israel. Well, I don't think it's between God and Israel. Okay. I just think the blessings of it, the salvation of Israel comes uh, at the second advent. Right. So again, that, that, that is a very legitimate view. And again, that's one of the ones that are in the book. So, I mean, what it comes down to, it seems for me, is to read the book, see the argumentation on the different sides, and then you have to come to what you feel like best explains that situation. And, you know, I don't think this is a difference that, it's a very fine point. It doesn't mean we shouldn't wrestle with it and come to a conviction on it, but it's, People are going to land on it differently, and we're going to agree with each other on a lot of points about it, but we're going to express it differently and, and maybe have a different belief as far as when the New Covenant is inaugurated. I guess I just don't see why we, when Christ said this is the New Covenant of blood, why we can't enter into the blessings of it now. So... What are the blessings of the new covenant that's spelled out by Jeremiah 31? And, and well, it's, it's not just the, all the things that are specified, but it's obviously it implies regeneration and the spiritual life. So I agree that we have those blessings for sure, but I just wouldn't connect them with Jeremiah 31 because they're not even promised to us in Jeremiah 31. Hmm. And again... I know uh, it seems like I'm splitting hairs here, but I, I agree that we have those blessings, and I agree that they're very similar to what's described in Jeremiah 31 and the other Old Testament texts that describe regeneration, indwelling the Spirit, those kinds of things. But I don't think every one of those Old Testament texts is talking about the relation to Israel. Right. And so for me, the best way to say it is we, we, what we have is very similar to that, but it doesn't fulfill the new covenant, and it's you can see where we have what we have by virtue of, of Christ, but Christ's blood is also the blood of that covenant that's still future. So I think both things are happening, both are true, but the blood of the covenant is a covenant that's still to come. I just, and again, I, I'm, uh, this reading this chapter in this book helped me solidify that more. I'm still open to being persuaded differently. <laughs> Uh, but right now, I would argue that that new covenant is still to be entered into in the future. That Christ's blood is the blood of that covenant. Think about it this way. The, the only reason, or the only means by which they're going to enter into the blessings that are promised in the Old Testament is when they embrace Christ as the Messiah. And that doesn't happen until the future. So, 
I would just say that we we have things that are very similar, and it, and it really does come down to how you try to articulate. We have things that are very similar to this, what's described in Jeremiah 31, but I think we have them by being in Christ, not in any way by fulfilling the new covenant. I guess I just have a point process is in the new covenant. Yes. That language, uh, it's hard to get around the I understand. Yeah, I do. And again, you know, that's the same issue that some of these guys take. Yeah, that's kind of the crux of the It really is. Of the whole argument. It is. Yeah. I just, as I've looked at it, as I've read these guys, as I've looked at the argument of Hebrews more, for me the best way to articulate it is that we have the mediator of the new covenant, we have Christ, but the new covenant itself has not yet begun to be fulfilled. Okay, is there anything else we want to say about the New Covenant? I guess that's the last slide for this lesson. I want to talk a little bit about next week and what we'll start then, but are there any other questions about the New Covenant today? Matt, is there anything else you want to say? I think it's worth saying that these, you said at the beginning these are very nuanced and there's small differences in what, whether inauguration is different than fulfillment or not. Right. And then there's a wider gap with then whether you say that the church and Israel have, are the same. Exactly. And an even wider gap between people who would say Christ wasn't the Messiah at all. Right. With, with we wouldn't have any fellowship. Exactly. So it's, yeah. it's just good to keep in perspective. It is. That's very important. I don't want to confuse you. And I've, I've, I kind of felt like the last lesson I taught might have done that. This is something that even people within dispensationalism that we would have very common beliefs are still wrestling with, and that's the way doctrine works. It gets worked out through time, through discussion, through debate. So don't let this bother you in any way, but let it drive you to further study and to coming to the thing where you, what you believe is best articulated by these scripture passages. Again, I think the argument that Charles is making and the one that Matt has presented and even the things in these books, there are very strong arguments. And you can take those positions because you feel like that's the one that has the best evidence. But there are also other arguments and the kinds of the ones that I've made this morning that, that are out there. And you, know, you just have to wrestle with it uh, to, to, get, to come down to the best way to articulate it. Okay, so next week we'll begin Old Testament survey. And this is what we'll be doing during the second hour. I wanted to tell you about two different books. And it kind of depends on the track that you want to do this on. Uh, the one that I would encourage you, uh, if you've never done an Old Testament survey before, and other ladies are using this book, it's Paul Benware's Survey of the Old Testament. Buy this on Amazon. If you buy it, make sure you get the, this later edition because in the earlier edition it doesn't have the graphics and the tables, which are very helpful. But this, what we'll be doing is basically walking through the Old Testament a book at a time. So it's going to be a very broad overview, but it will help you in the same way that putting the outside puzzle pieces of a puzzle does to see what the message of the Old Testament is. Um, so this is... This is a good basic book on that. That's right, the Kindle version doesn't have graphics. Yeah, so don't get the electronic version. Again, get this one that looks like this. How, does everybody use Amazon to buy books? That's all I use. You can, there's other places. Okay, so A books, Amazon, there's several used books. I would get used copies, they're cheaper and uh, just make sure you get the one that has a cover that looks like this. The other cover looks much different, and it's just text. It doesn't have any of the illustrations. So I make sure you get, if you get that. No pictures? No pictures. That's, that's the downside. This one only has text anyway, and the only edition of it. And as you can see, it's much bigger, more like a doorstop than Benware's is. But this is an excellent book. It's called Old Testament Theology. I know that Matt has a copy of this, and Daniel has, you've borrowed Matt's copy, right, and they're reading it. I've talked to Charles about it already. And I don't want to discourage any of you that want to read this. It's just bigger, it's theologically deeper, and 
and richer. Uh, so if you want to try to read this, I would definitely encourage you to. It sounds like most everybody here is going to have access to it. Aaron, I need to talk to Aaron, or if you would just pass along to him. I'll send these out in the email where you can just click on the link and order it off of Amazon if you want to. But this this guy goes book by book through the Old Testament and just in very clear writing uh, summarizes the message of each book. So we won't be necessarily working through these books in our time on Sunday mornings, but if you'll read these during the week and prepare, it'll make a big difference in what we do on Sunday morning. We'll also plan to put these messages up on the website so you can go back to them and listen to them there. The last thing that I wanted to do was uh, we sent out an email about some churches in North Carolina that were helping with the relief effort for Hurricane Florence. And you can give to those in a couple of different ways. If you want the tax deduction, it would be important for you to give through our church designate. If you give online, all you can designate is that it goes to missions, right? I don't think there's a place where you can indicate on the memo what it's for. No, that's right. Benevolence. That that yeah, that will let us know on that one. Just, just use the drop-down box and go to benevolence, and if you give to benevolence in the next couple of weeks, we'll assume that that means you want to give it to the storm relief. The other way is, within that email, there's a link that you can click on there and give directly through a Facebook page. And I assume that you don't get a tax deduction there because I don't think it would go through a church, necessarily. But what we, would, what we plan to do is give each of you a week or two to pray about that and decide if, if you want to give towards it. And then we will use some existing church funds to supplement that. These are two different churches. Matt happens to know both of the pastors. Uh, they, he was in seminary with both those guys. And so we feel comfortable in giving towards those churches, mainly to help the people within their own congregation. Email has more details about that.